Uh, now we're going to move on to our second speaker. Justin is a second year here at Robert Wood Johnson, originally hailing from Wayne, New Jersey. He graduated from Johns Hopkins with a BA in biology and a minor in entrepreneurship and management. He then worked as a clinical research coordinator in the Department of Urology at Weill Cornell. When he's not sending out those journal, those journal club emails, Justin pursues his love of film by co-hosting the podcast, TwoGuysOneMovie.com. Throughout these past couple weeks, Justin has never failed to make us smile. His charisma definitely captivated the committee, and I'm sure it will be refreshingly evident tonight. Please give a warm welcome to the funniest guy around, Justin Dubin. So, presenting here at this med talk is a little bit funny for me. I mean, don't get me wrong, I've always wanted to get on stage and give a talk, but there's always been one problem. At this point, I don't think I know enough about medicine to get on stage and give a credible med talk. I've been watching TED Talks, Med Talks, and all these other talks for years, and fundamentally, those people with credibility, you know, those with PhDs from Stanford, MDs from Harvard, those who have traveled to South America, who've cured kids of some obscure disease that only three people have ever heard of, these are the kinds of people who usually give med talks. And me? I'm just a med student. What credibility do I have at this point? I mean, seriously, at this point, I think I can give a proficient talk in several things. Eating, sleeping poorly, and studying. And to be honest with you, I really don't think I've mastered those skills as well as some of the, uh, my students, uh, the students in my class. There is one thing I know for certain, though, and that is that in medicine, there are no absolutes. And yet, there's a whole lot of people out there trying to find concrete answers in this vastly indeterminate industry. That sounds quite like a paradox. I mean, medicine has really put us in a paradox. And I'm a big fan of paradoxes, you know. The problem is they, they kind of can be confusing at first, like a skinny fat man or a greasy salad. But the more you think about it, they do make sense. More importantly, though, paradoxes make you think. Thinking about the paradox that medicine presents, I can't help but think, what can I truly ever know? So I wasn't the first person to think about this, of course. And it may have been Socrates thousands of years ago to put this thought to paper, be the first person to put this thought to paper, when he said, I know one thing that I know nothing, now known as the Socratic paradox. So I know one thing that I know nothing. So one of the smartest, most well-learned, most intelligent people in the history of our planet is saying that as much as he knew and as much as he learned, he still realized that he had only simply tapped the surface of the pool of knowledge potentially out there. He understood that our knowledge of the world is constantly evolving. What is considered to be true one day can absolutely be considered taboo the next. And for this reason, we need to continuously question everything, especially those things that are the most accepted of truths. So, so what if I don't know everything? In coming to terms with it, I also realized neither does anyone else. <laughs> History has shown us that as much as we'd like to think we know, we really don't know anything. I, seriously. Think about this for a second. History has shown us that we have probably been more wrong in what we thought to be true than right. For the longest time, we thought that the sun went around the earth. We thought that the earth was flat. Cigarettes were once physician tested and approved. <laughs> These were all once accepted truths. Fortunately for us, people have come around and who have understood our histories of people. And they've challenged these accepted truths because they understood we couldn't be complacent in our knowledge of the world. My point is here that medicine is an imperfect science. And we as physicians need to continuously challenge the status quo. This mentality has to start here in medical school before you go on and do research at Stanford or travel to South America and cure those kids of that obscure disease I probably never hear of. This realization has allowed me to challenge myself and my understanding of the world around me so that one day I can help solve many of the problems that we're facing today. 
Now, embracing the paradox can seem depressing at first, but upon further insight, it should leave you inspired. So, one of my favorite medical studies goes back to one of the most prevalent and oldest medical practices in the last 5,000 years. I'm talking about bloodletting. Bloodletting, also known as phlebotomy, is the art of drawing blood. Now what they would do is they would cut open your artery or vein with something that looked like that, and they would draw as much blood from you as they thought was fit to cure your ailment. Now, there was a slight problem with the process. Okay, a little bit more than a slight problem. It was potentially deadly. Famous people such as uh, Mozart, King Charles II, and George Washington were actually thought to have died due to complications in bloodletting. Fortunately for us, evidence-based medicine arrived on the scene in the mid to late 19th century. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and scientists such as Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch started to realize that bloodletting was doing more harm than good. They challenged an over 5,000-year-old practice, potentially saving thousands if not millions of lives. But now, here's where our story gets really interesting. Recent studies are once again starting to turn the tables on the therapeutic applicability of bloodletting. Recent studies are starting to show a direct correlation between increased blood donation frequencies and low risks of cardiovascular disease. So, the more you donate blood, lower risk of cardiovascular disease. I am pretty sure that is the definition of karma, if you ask me. <laughs> so let's think about this for a second. We actually went full circle on this thing. Evidence-based medicine helped overturn an over 5,000-year-old medical practice. Now that same evidence-based medicine is pulling another 180 on us and is saying, hey, maybe they weren't so wrong. What does the future hold for phlebotomy? What does the future hold for any of our accepted practices of today? Is there some shunned medical practice out there waiting to be rediscovered? I'm not completely sure, but if the history of bloodletting shows us anything, it sure seems possible. So, bloodletting was fixed in the 19th century with evidence-based medicine. With evidence-based medicine by our side, we we're sure to be free from any more medical blunders, right? Well. If Socrates taught us anything when he said, I know one thing, that I know nothing, he taught us that not even evidence-based medicine could free us from the paradox. For those of you who have seen movies such as Planet of the Apes or One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, you may be familiar with the procedure known as the lobotomy, now known as one of the most spectacular failures in the history of medicine. So what they would do with the lobotomy is they would take a 10-inch spike and they would hammer it right into your orbital socket and they would scramble up the, front of your, your, the frontal lobe of your brain, hopefully curing whatever medical ailment you had at the time. Now, it kind of looks like a good time if you ask me. <laughs> now, believe it or not, initial research and studies showed the lobotomy to be very effective. So much so that Igas Moniz, the creator of the lobotomy, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1949. So fortunately for us, scientists continued to do research, they continued to practice and use the lobotomy, and eventually they realized that the lobotomy was doing much, much, much more harm than good. Igas Moniz went from Nobel Prize winner one day to monster overnight. Now, my point of these studies is to demonstrate how fragile medicine truly is. But as physicians, it's not only important for us to understand the fragility of medicine, but we need to embrace it. Had it not been for all those scientists and phys physicians challenging these practices, we all very well could be going down the street to Dr. Acula's bloodletting clinic to get our headaches fixed. And if that didn't work, we could always be getting that lobotomy. So, Medicine, so the paradox has shown us that we need to question the commonly accepted practices of our time. But along those same lines, the paradox can also extend to questioning ourselves. Now, 
As a medical student, I've worked with my fair share of physicians, and I think it's safe for me to say that lack of confidence is definitely not an issue within medicine. Now, it makes sense. People are putting their lives in your hands. You better be confident in yourself and your own abilities. But overconfidence, now, that seems to be a problem on the rise. In one recent study, what they did is they asked a group of radiologists with varying diagnostic abilities to rate their confidence in their own abilities. What they discovered was that the, top, the bottom 20 radiologists actually had significantly higher confidence in their own abilities than the top 20 radiologists. So the confidence level of the worst performers was significantly higher than that of the top performers. That, that sounds wrong. That can't be right. Now, in another more recent study, internists were asked, were given two easy and two difficult cases. And in each case, they were asked to make a diagnosis, recommend additional tests, as well as rate their confidence in their, in their diagnosis. Now, despite only answering 55% of the easy cases correctly and 5.8% of the hard cases correctly, the physicians were equally as confident in both situations in their diagnoses. Even more so, the increased confidence was directly correlated to lower a lower number of recommended additional tests, which surely could have helped make the correct diagnosis. So what do these studies mean? What are they saying? What these studies are really saying is that the level of physician confidence has little to no correlation with the physician's ability to pre accurately predict the, to predict the accuracy of their clinical diagnosis. Now, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this with all the physicians in the room, but what these <laughs> studies are actually saying is that as much as physicians would like to think they know, they can't know it all. Physicians are putting too much trust in what they think they know and not questioning their own knowledge enough. Never before in the history of medicine have we been more inundated with information and scientific knowledge. I mean, we've put a man on the moon. We have discovered subatomic particles that we never could have dreamed to have existed. In a few years, we plan on making a human liver out of a 3D printer. And yet, we still can't cure male pattern baldness. <laughs> as much as we know about cancer, we still can't cure all of it. We know so much, and yet we still know so little. What the paradox does for me, and why I think it's so important, is that it allows us to realize that we can make mistakes. After all, no one's perfect. Well, Maybe except for Jennifer Lawrence, of course, but <laughs> that's a whole nother lecture in itself. <laughs> except understanding you're able to make mistakes, you should be more open to <laughs> other opportunities. You should be more open to alternative diagnoses, alternative treatments, and more important to collaboration, all of which will help you have better patient care. Basically, what the paradox is doing, it allows you to see where you lie on the spectrum of knowledge in any given topic. It allows you to see the donut and the hole, not just the donut. This enables you to have a more successful approach towards problem solving. Basically, what it comes down to it, I guess what I'm trying to say is that one, after only acknowledging that we don't know anything, can we truly start to learn everything? And this is what it's all about, because the paradox creates opportunity because it allows us to open our minds and understand what is not only un un unknown to us, but is all what is also unknown in the most established of fields. Just because that PhD from Stanford, that MD from Harvard, and that damn guy who's in South America making us all look bad, <laughs> curing all those kids, just because they know a lot doesn't mean they're always right. As we all move on and earn our medical degrees and get into a specialty, a lot of questions will be answered, but a lot more will arise. Not only will there be more questions, but these questions will be continuously more difficult and more complex. 
Should this get you down? Absolutely not. The reason why I love medicine so much is because it is so dynamic. The bottom line is this. Medicine is constantly evolving because it has to. And we as physicians have to continuously challenge the status quo. We need to continue generating ideas because good or bad, these ideas help advance our knowledge of the world around us. Complacency in your own education and complacency in the practices of our time will not only harm you as a physician, but they will also be potentially depriving your patients of better health care. From, from Socrates himself, I know one thing that I know nothing. From exploring the unknown to challenging even the most accepted of truths, the Socratic paradox shows us that the opportunity for progress is right in front of us. All we need to do is acknowledge that it exists. After all, we're all here to help people. And although we can't answer everything, we can all help by answering one question at a time. But then again, what the hell do I know anyway? Thank you.